Thanks, Mike, and hello to colleagues here and uh, over in Kuching. I was five, five years ago, I think. Um, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk today about something uh, that I started doing some time ago. In fact, I'm going to go back to my first experience in higher education research. I'll, I'll start first with a few shaping perspectives. Um, <clears throat> and I'll define the concept of student engagement. Who's familiar with the term student engagement? Okay. Good. When I started working in this field, there was uh, only people saying it's an evil word. So we've come a long way. Um, sample of current practices. Uh, insights from research. When I say practices, I'm, going to be, I'm a research guy, so I'm going to be drawing on, showing you a bit of the contours of the field over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And then survey some improvement opportunities. Um, if anyone knows how to make higher education better, faster and cheaper in the ways that it needs to be over the next 10 years, please let me know. Um, there are absolutely no magic solutions, but I'm going to put up a screen that hopefully will give you some food for thought. Yeah, PowerPoints are all available, as are lots of readings. Um, so first of all, some shaping perspectives. Um, best university in Australia, okay? So just have a think about this. And I want you to think most particularly about how on earth you might go about answering this question. Okay? That's what I care about. And in a way, um, I think the question's a silly question, yet it's one we're all absolutely preoccupied with almost globally. So it's something that we need to, uh, need to invest some energy in. I think it's a silly question because the idea of best implies uh, unidimensionality, as I might say. Uh, and I'll go into a bit more about that. But have a think about these young people uh, demonstrating jointly the limit of my drawing skills. I have to say that because we're in a design building. Um, who's got uh, people in their lives who are giving consideration to these difficult questions right now? Yeah, I, I do. I have a daughter going into prep next year. What to do after school? <laughs> I've, I've tried not to refer to it as her 13 year sentence, but I, I am against compulsory schooling altogether. So, um, um, you know, in 100 years we may have reformed school education as much as we have higher education. What to do after school? Uh, really tricky thing. I'm tr still trying to figure that out particularly this one, and of course, how to build a career, okay? A eternally difficult thing. And we're just now starting to realise that the usual HR um, approach to some of these questions and, and counselling and advising approach to some of these questions just doesn't reflect the individuality or the particularity of people's lives. So along the way, I'll say, in, in, in the time that's available, a few things about how we're thinking about things differently. This is the dominant way in which we now understand the concept of best. Is everyone familiar with the Shanghai ranking or the academic ranking of World University? Yeah, and everyone familiar that the way that we rate uh, education is to do with the number of Nobel Prizes and Fields Medals? Now, I've yet to see any scientific proof that that has anything to do with university education whatsoever. Uh, I think it's a huge, I, full respect to the colleagues in Shanghai who, with help from the ministry and all sorts of other things, have built this up. It's probably the best of a bad lot. Um, the sooner we get rid of this 20-year-old technology, and it is about 20 years old in its design now, uh, the better off we'll be. And the sooner we move on to thinking about smarter ways of thinking about education, the better we'll be. But that infects exactly the way, you know, it goes all the way from these global conversations down to what we do in our desk, okay? Institutional strategy, you know, we can see Swinburne have undertaken reforms in the last 10 years just to perform better on these sorts of things. They really are counting, so we do need to take them seriously. However, if you start to ask those sort of questions I put up before, uh, and you go to Google, and instead of typing Hamish Coates, um, I type, type these things. Right? So I'm not going to go through them in detail. But I have put up these little images just to indicate how, how weird and wonderful this landscape is. So I'll, I'll point to a few. Um, the one in the middle there is Barack Obama's attempt to try and reform higher education. Um, college scorecard, hanged on the White House webpage. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of other ones. Um, there's return on investment calculators. Um, the reason I've made them so small that you can hardly read them is just to demonstrate to, to us, we are inside this industry, we work in this field, how confusing this is. So for me, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old child, if I was to actually say, where should I invest in their education across their lifespan, or at least for the next 20 years in which I probably will have some role in it? Um, I, I, there's nothing to answer that question for me, even as, a, even as a person working in the field, let alone for people who have no idea. 
it's a really confusing field uh, for know how to invest. And I, I'm using the word invest in the broadest possible sense, not just a financial sense. Although if you do go to the pay scale return on investment report, you will see that Harvey Mudd College is where you should invest. Elite, anyone heard of Harvey Mudd College? Yep, you're engineers, aren't you? Yep. Uh, elite, I'm going to get this wrong, but elite engineering school somewhere in the Midwest uh, of America, Colorado or California? Colorado, yeah. Yep. Uh, 20% 20, 20 return on investment, 8% uh, return on investment per annum over 20 years. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, as I say, when I'm in China, that's better than investing in the Chinese economy. Okay? Not Harvard. That's not the best. Uh, and there's some big players in this game now. Brookings Institution, The Economist, they all have very sophisticated return on investment calculators for American colleges. As does LinkedIn for, oh, there we are, that one, for this place and the place where I work. Okay? It's a big game now, trying to rate higher education. Unfortunately, it's a failed game. And it's resembled somewhat what the economists refer to. Any economists here? No, because that's, I'm saved, because my description of the market for lemons, uh, which is why I put up the used car, is, is always flawed because I'm not an economist. But basically because we're not sending good quality information to the market, it's an asymmetric market, we have monopoly powers in large part. We're sending detailed signals to the market, which we construct about a credence good. You don't know how good our soup is until you've drunk it. And it makes people's purchasing behaviours, and don't forget people are purchasing, investing their time, and alone their money, and their futures with us. It makes them very difficult, if not flawed. And what unfortunately that does as well is it degrades the quality of what we're doing. Because really good quality can't demonstrate it's really good to the market. Because really bad quality is also coming up with the same jargon, right? And it's exactly the same as the used car market. A uh, concept invented by a guy called Akalov who uh, won a Nobel Prize for it. Look it up, the market for lemons. Um, you'll see in that uh, beautiful paper about 20, 30 years ago, um, perfect description of some aspects of higher education globally. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about. In fact, Australia's done more in this area than most other countries. Um, and um, and uh, his wife is the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, so a bit of a power couple. That's the market for lemons. How do we start to re-understand higher education so we can do a better job? Okay. So instead of thinking that institutions do things to those people down below, which we refer to as students, or insert word here, hopefully their names, right? we can instead think that many, many different students construct higher education in their own unique and individual ways. We all do this. As we walk into it, I've just walked into Swinburne. I used to live in William Street back in 1990. I worked out in Camwell Station for eight years. You know, we all construct Swinburne in very different ways. I've been to most of your campuses over the years. Different constructions of the same place. That's how we need to start understanding our students. And as I get to the end of my uh, talk today, I will tell you about some contemporary work that we're doing to try and build up that picture. Just a few final thoughts. Um, as we move from really elite systems, so Australia's done this over the last 30 years, uh, since the late 80s, since Swinburne's a product of this transition, uh, and uh, to a universal system, and Malaysia's done it much, much, much more deftly over the last five to ten years in very different ways than Australia's done it. Uh, largely through private higher education. Uh, we need to start having information on the effectiveness about what we do. Okay? Not just on what we're doing or the quality of it, but how well we're achieving what we're doing. And uh, again, I want to focus on the idea of success, which I'll return to at the end of the presentation. And we also need to make sure that we're not focusing on what we put into higher education. You know, I really couldn't care less what the budget, what the revenue of the university is. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old the institution is. It doesn't matter how many Nobel laureates we plug into the side of the institution. Okay? It does matter what we do when we've got people in our institutions. Uh, and, and, and I want to be clear, I probably should just find this at the start. When I'm talking about institution, I'm talking about online and physical, all in one. Right? And I'll say more about that as I go through. Uh, and of course, it really matters what we, what we deliver at the end of it. This really counts. Unfortunately, we know almost nothing about it. We know we produce graduates, but the variation in quality or impact of those graduates is really hard to say anything about, even in fields like medicine or engineering, which are highly accredited. Okay? Uh, that's the subject of a different talk, but one, uh, an idea I just want to park. Uh, to turn to the idea of student engagement. Okay? So, here's the idea. 
Um, um, I think I first wrote this PowerPoint slide back in 2001. Yeah, but, you know, Self-applied Jerusalem is an excellent thing, and if it wasn't written well in the first place, I wouldn't be using it 500 times. The definition hasn't changed. It's, it's an equation that takes us and students. Are there any students? Yes, you? We co-create or co-produce. The word used to be co-produce, but now I have a PhD student doing work on co-creation. So these are, so you could think about the PhD as the ultimate co-creation experience, but we could actually uh, reform most of what we do in higher education. I was just talking with Mike before about co-creating assessment tasks. We could redo most of higher education realising that students and their time is the most underused resource that we have before us. 60,000 students at Swinburne. Uh, I don't know how many thousand staff, but there's, we're way outnumbered. And if we can somehow get them involved in co-creating what we do, and I don't mean for, you know, uh, pernicious institutional or sectoral ends, I mean for themselves, for knowledge. Uh, we're much better off in how we do it, and of course technology plays a, a huge role in that. Um, hopefully I've left that up for long enough that, um, and hopefully, can colleagues in Malaysia, can you read that? Yep, okay. Um, so what do I mean? Well, here's a really general framework, uh, just to give a plug to something called Education at a Glance, which is a telephone book put out by the OECD every year, um, completely mistitled. Um, that defines education in terms of outcomes, processes and inputs for individuals, teachers, providers and the systems uh, as a whole. Okay, so we can sort of split up most of what we do in education by this sort of logic. We focus on reputation and there's nothing wrong with that. Let's, let's make the most of our excellent reputation we have in Australia and it's Australian higher education, excellent reputations that we have around the world. Um, but we need to also start to focus on what we do and how we teach as institutions and most particularly how students come in and how they leave. And if we cover up that space into this green section here, it's what I'm broadly terming as involving what we focus on with respect to student engagement. Okay? How institutions and teachers provide supports that help students learn and engage and things that are linked with good quality learning. Okay? We're not interested in things that we do or students do that have no effect on learning outcomes or graduate outcomes, however you talk about it. We're only interested in doing things that actually make a difference, okay? So we could think about the student experience as being everything, you know, finding someone who you're going to marry, having a good car parking experience, um, eating a good sausage roll or chico roll in the cafeteria. Um, but, you know, show me a scientific paper that links that with generating a graduate who gets a better job, okay, or goes on to do further study, or writes better poems, or the like, okay. That's what we're focused on with respect to student engagement. Huge amount of research, um, a lot of it <coughs> American. Um, this is just a slide that I've put up just to um, give you some sense that it's not something I cooked up on the tram on the way over. Um, but what I have become, and in a lot of these, you know, I go to America a lot and a lot of these people are my buddies, but what I have to say is America's very different to Australia and a lot of this stuff was done in white, liberal arts, male only, elite, New England colleges back in the 1970s and 80s. And a couple of years ago I walked down from my office which was then on Swanson Street and I noticed there was a whole bunch of Chinese students, you know there's an intersection and um, like thousands and I thought this is not white you know go through it again so again I'm going to come back to some of the contemporary work that we're doing to try and think about where Australia's moved ahead of the white male the rights dot 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 all right so um, we have got an evidence base that's important in fact in our more recent work we've ended up returning to some of the uh, the good thing that these people have done but but with some better intelligence about what's going on in our own context uh, why do we bother uh, gives us some information. Um, you know, higher education is run in a political way, not a, not, a, not a scientific way. That's the way we work. We get our money from the government and we fight internally about how to spend it and how to organise bureaucracies and things like this. Uh, more and more as the markets change, we're moving to more scientific forms of management. And in those contexts, data really counts. Okay? Even if it just proves what we already know, isn't it lovely to have evidence that, for, that, uh, for that purpose? It gives us uh, uh, good, good quality research materials that we can use to run the institutions, um, capacity to monitor and improve, insights into what students are actually doing. 
you know, we have a history of measuring satisfaction. I'll say some more about that in the slides to come. Um, very hard to do anything about satisfaction for a whole range of reasons, but actually student engagement, which is concrete behavioural type data, you can action. If you know that only 10% of first year students have gone into the library, that's something that you can have something done to it. Okay? If you know they're not happy with the library, who knows what the purpose is? You know, well, maybe they haven't even gone there in the first place. Okay, so it's, it's behavioural type stuff that we can use to actually make a difference in higher education. Um, so, sample of current practices. So where I started, and I thought I'd just, it was a bit of a, bit of a personal journey, but in a way um, uh, it, it, it gets me to where I want to go to in terms of talking about success. Uh, it was in about 1999, uh, we, when I first started doing my uh, graduate work at the University of Melbourne, we got a project to redevelop the CEQ. Who's heard of the CEQ? Course Experience Questionnaire, yeah. So it had been implemented in, it had been developed in the UK, white, liberal arts, male, you know, these assumptions, brought over here by a chap called Paul Ramsden, and implemented as part of the um, Dawkins reforms, loosely speaking, and the National Data Architecture that was set up, which by and large hasn't changed for the last 30 years, although undergoing gradual reform. Um, and Australia has very good national data architecture since that time. Um, and implemented with the graduate destination survey. So it was locked on as a graduate survey because we had no mechanism back in those days to do it to current students. It was just way too expensive. The government wasn't going to pay. But it only focused on what went on inside the classroom. And we knew from our American buddies and their enormous decades of, uh, their several decades of study of the student experience, that in fact most learning happens between the buildings. Right? The definition of the campus is the place between the buildings. So we got a project uh, uh, to go from talking about these things to instead talking about those things, which are the five new scales, if you like, that we added. Uh, and um, for my sins, when I worked at ACER, which is up in Camberwell Station, I then had the job for several years of, of writing the national report. And while it was really great to start talking about what's going on outside the classroom and those broader forms of learning and experience and development that people have as part of higher education, which weren't even being discussed, right? It was just assumed, but they weren't part of the national or institutional or individual discourse, if you like, because we weren't measuring them. Um, gradually realised that we were still just measuring, you know, something that has strongly disagree and strongly agree, uh, and we weren't really, there was no shift. In fact, if you look at these figures, they just waft slowly upwards, which is great. Um, uh, who knows why? But we were just wafting slowly upwards on these scales. Uh, and people used to argue about the difference between a 4.35 and a 4.37. Uh, you know, and uh, while we, you know, there's no such thing as illegal statistics, there probably should. And a lot of the conversations we have in this sort of regard are not just meaningless, but they're a waste of our time. You know, we're having conversations about second decimal places, and we're actually missing missing the whole discourse that we should be having. So I started to do some work in my PhD. Great book. I believe it's, uh, I believe it's still for sale. <laughs> um, and it was on campus-based online education. Um, you know, learning management systems were just being introduced uh, at the time to universities. We were just writing a, a plan, a recommendation to the University of Melbourne as to what they should introduce. They'd, probably the only university at that stage that didn't have one or didn't have a centralised one, um, and came up with the idea that in fact students, I looked at how students learn on campus and then online. And when I say online, I mean campus-based online students, because the that's where most online learning happens, right? What we're here talking about is blended or hybrid education. Uh, and came up with a typology of four different student types, okay? And, and realised that some people are very introverted face-to-face, -face, but highly extroverted online and all the rest of it. Uh, and so developed an instrument for that. Um, finished the PhD, got a job, and then thought, right, we can roll this out. Um, and then came up with this thing called the Aussie. So rather than build out the instrument from the PhD, thought, I'll go to my American buddies and let's start to get some global benchmarks happening. Because we can have a fight within Australia, or within an institution, or within an apartment about what student engagement is. But if you can suddenly see that, wow, there's 1,000 institutions over the other side of the world doing it and you can compare the data, it really does change the conversation. So I came up with a model. Um, it was around just, just, just before all that Gillard sort of reform around um, uh, 
uh, aspirations and work. So some of this language is, is, is nuanced by that policy logic that was going on in Australia about 10 years ago, um, which, which we're now seeing through the other end of the cycle after six or seven years. Uh, but shaping aspirations, looking at how students get admitted and integrated, how they're involved and retained, and how they um, how they how they they transfer out of our out of our good care into the labour market or further study, and developed an instrument uh, that measured various parts of that cycle, focused for the most part on involvement and retention type issues, student engagement, um, but um, also added some self-reported outcomes in there. Because as I said before, we almost know nothing about I know we give our students marks, but they're all private. In Australia, they're private. In America, they're less private. But in Australia, they're private. And even when they're less private, it still doesn't mean that they're any good. You know, they're not reliable. A GPA at one institution is not the same as a GPA at another institution. So over a period of years, we managed to scale this. Uh, and there's another book that we put out in 2014, me and Alex, who runs the American collection. Uh, and through an OECD project that I led for about five, six years, we've now gone into several different countries. And I was just having a conversation about the ISI, the Irish Survey of Student Engagement. And they have a chapter in there. They were just finishing their first collection when we were writing the book, so they popped in uh, a chapter about the ISI. Um, and now we have global benchmarks. And the China College Student Survey, I think, is now the, probably the biggest student survey in the world, and it's underpinned by that. Not by my work, by my American colleagues' work, but you can see how a little idea can spark a collaboration and, uh, you know, uh, in these days when we can communicate so easily with colleagues all around the world, things can happen quickly. Um, so you start to get a conversation about student engagement happening to the extent that in 2016, when you speak with colleagues like us, people know what I'm talking about. Okay, so we've now shifted the discourse away from satisfaction to engagement. I got work, which I'll now talk about, oh, little interlude. <laughs> Um, developed one for the National Quality Council, which is defunct, but it used to be part of the institutional architecture of vocational education in Australia, in charge of quality. Um, you know, we've got different regulatory arrangements now, but um, there is a national instrument for um, uh, for, um, for 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 um, youth in vet in Australia, uh, in which I snuck this in. Very controversial. You know, I remember sitting around with the people who are in charge of licensed trades and they would say, why don't we, why do we care about that? Anyway, so that was good. We got that in. So there is, all of a sudden I realised, right, we've now got data across the education spectrum because, of course, there's also some data on student engagement in schools. I don't think that's mandatory anymore, but it's around. And I was up in Canberra on Friday and they keep having new thoughts about, about having data collections. Um, around about 2010, the government thought we need some more data because this satisfaction stuff isn't working for us anymore. <coughs> um, <coughs> and we want to, like, there was 40 universities and a bunch of other providers doing the Aussie. Uh, and so they paid us to develop what became known as the University Experience Survey, uh, in which we developed, we sort of got an opportunity to say, well, that engagement stuff's great and got the satisfaction stuff. You know, if you, in a lot of ways, when you look at what Australia does, we get stuff from America, stuff from Europe, and stuff from Asia. And we sort of make it Australia. And all you have to do is walk down and see the mix of restaurants down in uh, Glenfrey Road, and it's the same deal in a different area. And it was great. We stood back and we said, what really counts in terms of understanding how students experience and succeed in higher education? And took a fresh look. First of all, they need to be included, supported, taught, then they engage, and then finally they develop. No? Not rocket science. And as a result of that, we developed an instrument which we could then run with every higher education provider as it now is, but back then with every university uh, on behalf of the government. Uh, and with some regret, uh, what happens when things are mandated by government in Australia is people don't like doing them. So all of the great conversation and research and workshops and conferences that we had around the Aussie, I don't think happen in this space anymore um, at all. Uh, it's just a compliance exercise. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean we don't have great quality data floating around. Now, if you haven't seen it, go to www.qilt.edu.au. It's all reported online. Uh, I think the website needs a fair bit of work. Uh, I have recently asked how many students have clicked on that website to help them make that education investment decision and um, haven't been able to get an answer. So I fear the answer is not as 
as, uh, as big as I, as I would hope for. I mean, it should be millions, right? But um, at least we are putting, as I said, in Australia, we are putting information on these core areas out there for the public to consume about what we do. That improves what we do. Because places that do it really well, like Swinburne, get known for doing it really well. And then people, there's a virtuous cycle. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's now known as the, um, the Student Experience Survey because um, it in includes non-universities, uh, providers who aren't universities. Uh, two years ago, decided that surveys were dead. Um, they pretty much are. You know, my, my phone knows that I'm here with you. Um, all the rest of it, it doesn't have to rely on me. You know, I, I just when I was running the U UES survey, I remember getting a train up here and I was pinging every non-response to my phone because um, we were surveying 600,000 students and I just wanted to keep an eye, close eye on it. And I was aware that a tranche of invites would go out and within moments a tranche of unsubscribes because of the spam act would come, come back. And I thought they're not taking seriously the request that their government, their institution, their teachers and their fellow students are making of them. In fact, I don't know, if you ask 100 people, 20 respond and of that the R squared is about 5 to 10 statistically. I can explain about 5 to 10 percent of the variation. I'm not having a conversation with the people with whom I'm trying to have a conversation about improving and doing education better. So we need to do something fundamentally different. The technology isn't working for us. We've got all this lovely data floating around and at the same time we're using these constructs to understand students and teachers and all the rest of it that come from 1975 uh, New England. So we got some money from the government uh, when the OLT still existed uh, to do a project on student success. Now in Australia we don't actually have a way of defining student success, strange as it may seem. We define student success focused for the most part on disadvantaged students, where we do have an equity framework, which has a success measure, on getting at least 51 per cent in the subject, graduating, and a few other little measures like that but nothing like what we would understand to be student success. So we thought, let's look at this, this matter positively, and we came up with a, a, uh, a definition of student success. It's, it's too small to be read, but there are nine qualities there, and the report will be out soon. And the idea of intersectionality, which is this strange duck-like shape on the side here, is really, really important. What that means is, if, you know, I'm, I'm a product not of being male, this tall, um, Caucasian, dot, 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 you know? Demography is only explaining 5% of who I am. You need to understand me as an individual. Us as organisations need to deal with people as individuals, not as batch groups. Okay? So we've moved way beyond that and put in place some proposals for how we can take forward uh, an individualised conversation, or a conversation about helping every student who chooses or is able to take part in higher education in Australia, helping them succeed. That's what we must do in the future, and engagement plays an important role in that. How are we going to do it? Well, we need to mop up all of this kind of, I call it found data. Easier said than done, because of our systems, often legacy systems in higher education. Convert metrics into dashboards, and then of course the really tricky part, how we stage interventions as a result of that. So I'm going to skirt quickly through a few results to prove some points. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> but before I do that, I just want to take a little segue and talk about community co-creation. Because there's an aspect of engagement that has nothing to do with engaging students. It's about getting them out there in the community. Okay? There's a whole other side of that work uh, that we could talk about in another conversation, uh, which I won't, uh, I won't delve into today, uh, but it's growing massively, and particularly for an institution like Swinburne that has an excellent reputation for engagement with community, with industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to be thinking about how we can get our graduates out there, even more than we are, but more importantly, how we can recognise reward and report and encourage those forms of engagement. Okay? And a lot of that's happening through different conversations about engagement. I've just put up here a uh, template of the Global Reporting Initiative, which is primarily the way that organisations around the world do triple bottom line reporting, which can give us some clues on the way forward there. A little segue. Okay, some insights from research and then I'll, and then I'll sum up. Um, I will just pass quickly through some of these slides. Um, but they do give us a sense as to the value of asking uh, some of these questions, you know. Um, there's quite a divergence when we ask students and staff some of these things and they can lead to some very interesting conversations. These are all things you can do in your own teaching. Um, headline departure intention rates, 
at the start of the Aussie, I put in a question, uh, have you thought seriously about discontinuing your university studies before graduation or your studies before graduation? Uh, fed that through these different surveys. So it's now national data collection. Don't know, we don't quite know what happened there. But actually, that's a really good news story for Australia when you think about it. Look at that. We're doing something right. Okay? We're actually stopping students from wanting to leave. Don't know how, although I suspect uh, it has something to do with what I'll talk about in the next couple of minutes. And I put in a bunch of options, which are also, uh, uh, you can, student can write their own, uh, which we analysed. Uh, we actually got them off the initial responses, you know. Um, health, personal factors are huge. Uh, personal, you know, health, stress, work, family conflicts. Um, you know, the structural things like families moving into state, that's one thing. But the personal factors, and we can do something about that. Uh, we can do something, but we need to understand people as individuals, not as groups. And we can't just focus on the top or the bottom ends of our student distributions. It's, it's the people all across as individuals. Um, asked a lot of questions like this. I'm not going to pause on these for too long. Um, but you can start to see um, if you have many institutions, you know, that institution or teacher might want to have a conversation with that one there. You know? So we get some information that we can use to have some pretty informed conversations. We can look at how lazy some of our students are. Um, there's a a metric that says we should spend twice as long outside of class as we are in class. It's a rule of education, an educational rule of thumb, if you like. And if you actually look at the proportion of Australian students that are doing that, 27%. Okay. So how can we engage them more in just spending some more time on, on task? Um, we can start to make comparisons between students and staff. Uh, we developed a staff version of the instrument, more or less asking staff what they expected their students should be doing, which we could then compare against the actuals, which is the figures uh, that I'm putting up now. You can see quite a divergence. That's the space in which we need to have a conversation uh, to get both parties onto a better page. Uh, we can compare benchmarks across institutions. Um, so here are some Australian and New Zealand institutions. Um, uh, I de-identified them because I took them off my own data. This is data I prepared for the Commonwealth. It was the only data on education they had to compare Australian education with education in benchmark countries other than just numbers. It was quite startling. This is only 2010. Um, the situation hasn't changed. Uh, so you can start to see something's happening at these places. Okay? Uh, and you might want to reach out and have a conversation with those people. Low use of supports. right? You can get a sense of how students are actually using things that are funded by the institution, and we presume they are using, uh, if they're talking with careers advisors, etc. Uh, and if you divide up one of the scales that we constructed from the Aussie survey with supportive learning environment, if you divide that up by whether or not they say they're going to depart before their time is due, you can see quite a big divergence, right? So support started to stick out, as did enriching experiences, okay? Here, the students that have done an industry placement are showing high levels of engagement on every, on every dimension of engagement, higher scores in every dimension of engagement. So the moral of the story, um, which if you want to read the book, is produced by a guy called Graham Little, uh, who wrote a book called Faces on Campus back in the 70s, is that high challenge, high support is what creates what we call a cultivating or enriching environment. That's really important. High challenge, high support, and just to be clear, I don't mean training, it's there, his terms, but we don't mean training as in vocational education training. We mean a training-like environment. Even in VET, of course, we should have cultivating and enriching environments. Okay? Uh, that's the key to keeping students engaged through to graduation. Improvement opportunities, well, the most important one uh, is to not do this. Okay? That's what we might call a broken improvement cycle, but it's how high, it's the default option. And we've often had no choice because we just haven't had data available. Um, but our banks don't even work that badly anymore. We need to do a lot better to improve. And we're getting there in higher education so that we can join up the loop and actually do tomorrow better than today. And how do we go about doing that? Well, these are just a few snippets of ideas that I've collected uh, over, the, uh, over the period. Um, I'm not going to talk through them in any detail, but I'll just put them up so you can have a look. Maybe one of them might give you a little thought that you can take away. Uh, but if you are keen on following up in any particular area, do let me know and I will, um, 
I'll, I'll try to send you some publications. The outcome of the work that we've just delivered to the Commonwealth is to put in place a leadership architecture. And what we've basically said is there are nine qualities for success. It doesn't matter how you experience higher education in what field. We've tested these across Australia. Uh, we then need to put in place the data, the leadership and our understanding of success to affirm those nine qualities. And we need to audit our educational organisations and environments to make sure that we have the conditions that are going to support students in doing that. So if you like, some sort of architecture for helping us go about finding out whether or not we've got the conditions uh, to help students engage and succeed. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Questions for Hamish. Uh, very rich uh, presentation, lots of things there to take on board. So, so questions. Questions for Hamish. Uh, just up here, you could wait for the microphone. Nicholas Haritos, uh, retired academic. Uh, my uh, question is more of an observation, rather. Uh, engagement is a two-way process. And engagement is almost like enticement. You want to get students to go to the lecture or to, in, to get involved with the online resource or whatever. Uh, it's not just knowing about it. Uh, and uh, there are all sorts of ploys or, or um, approaches towards in, uh, enabling engagement. Um, are you able to share some of these with us? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in a way it's going to be hard to contextualise a situation more specific and as we've suggested, um, individual, in essence. Um, what do I say? You know, I first had this conversation with RMIT back in 2002, and I said it's really hard. We're in a big city institution, they walk out of the lecture theatre and they say, why are all the students sitting over in Starbucks? So what have we found in the university who have created these wonderful learning commons that are our students? There's but one example. Um, I, you know, why do we have lecture theatres uh, when everything's recorded and put online? I have no idea. Um, and so now when we do things, we don't get lecture theatres and we're going to very much on. So it looks very particular to the individual side of the campaign. Obviously, assessment plays a critical role in terms of providing the full community to engage students, not just for credit assessment, certainly not just assessment that we do to students. Students can assess themselves far more effectively than after the weekend. So, um, I'm going to go back to that slide, there's a million of um, institutes, if you like, uh, we always going to come down to what I do, you think it's going to be most effective in your context, I suppose. So, I have a question, another one over here. Um, do you see what role does the technology has to play in relation to engaging students? Uh, I, so I, I see technology as a slave. Yeah. I'm allowed. Uh, the conversations we were having back in 2001, when I did my PhD, uh, are the same ones we're still having, right? So the problem isn't the technology, because the technology has got a lot better. No, it hasn't changed. It didn't fly over here in the UFO, but the mobile phone I have now is a lot better than the mobile phone I didn't have then. So, what's the human problem that we're trying to solve? And then, what parts do humans play in that? What part do buildings play? What part? Because I think technology, I presume we have this sort of technology, but I'm seeing technology as the, the, the ecosystem around it. What part does the building play? What part do People like to sniff the pheromones in this game. You know, education's a people business. And there's a reason we're here today to celebrate you know, learning and teaching at school. It's really important. Um, alternative instruction from my sit in your offices or your labs, wherever the case may be, and, and, and let's all have a long Skype, it just ain't going to cut it. So, you know, look at uh, short answer, look to go to Google type something called National Centre for Academic Transformation, run by Carol Tweak over in America. Um, take education, specify the outcomes. Look at the cost structures, cost we have the cost of these, uh, nothing else in this business, we don't need to control that. Um, and I'm not just talking about salaries, I'm talking about the whole business enterprise of higher education globally. What are the outcomes and how can we redesign it in ways, and education plays a huge role in that. But, I want to go back to my earlier remarks, it ain't the solution. 
it's a little driver and they go all the way down. Correct. Those sorts of things. I'm just thinking, this a question from Sarawak. Any questions from there at all? Uh, yeah, there's a question, question there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one question. Yes, yes, I'm Heidi. Um, so you were talking about the, the, the high challenge and high support leading to the, the high engagement. And then you were talking <coughs> about the gap between the, the staff expectations and the student expectations. Where do you see the gaps in the, the gaps that we address in terms of the support that students are wanting? What are we offering? And Um, uh, so I'm speaking sort of in terms of the method or the approach we might use to answer that question because I'm not so familiar with the local context of teaching, which I don't understand it's very fast. Um, the, uh, you know, we need to understand every person on their notes and their terms. And I'll just go, I mean, my bank does that for me on my phone. So if you can, I'm not, not pro bank, you know, I'm not anti higher education, but it's saying in terms of service industries, Higher education has a huge way to go in terms of understanding people and their merits. So, what's a really easy, we've got to focus on every person as an individual. What's a really easy way of doing that? Divide the number of students by the number of staff, and the staff can spend five minutes on the phone calling all the students. Who are you? How can I help you learn? Uh, as one of the last chancellors said to me recently, the problem with that is there are staff I wouldn't want to call the students. So, there, there, you have, there you have a problem that needs to be solved. But finding out what each student wants to get out of higher education. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, when my three-year-old daughter turns over a shell and a rock wall, um, you know, I post something on Instagram or whatever the case might be, why doesn't, or a Twitter, why doesn't the university contact and say, has she thought about marine biology during this time? <laughs> yeah. um, so this, 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 it's about really looking at the individual. Uh, the batch isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. Now, how do you do that? That's, that's tough. We need to get a lot better at that. Some of it is technology, but some of it's just interpersonal conversations. Getting academics involved in admissions. No, great question there. So thank you very much there. We'll have to leave it there, so put your hands together once again for Hamish. Yeah, that's all.